I'm uh, Jim Morris with T1V. I'm the CTO at T1V. Uh, you know, the normal kind of things that I do is work on new product development, uh, you know, strategy, roadmap for our company. Uh, you know, but this product that you see here is one I was, uh, I was greatly involved with uh, along with Texas A&M. And, I, you know, I want to say that the, the thing that we're showing here is not something that, you know, T1V on, on our own just developed and then brought it to Texas A&M and said, hey, do you guys like this? I mean, actually, it was, it was a really collaborative effort between us and Texas A&M to develop it. So, uh, you know, so me and my team were highly involved with that. Definitely Mark and, uh, and Ed were both involved with that, along with some other professors from this university. So, anyway, that's my background. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Mark Henry, and uh, so I've been very involved in all of this, uh, working again with T1V. Uh, kind of the, the go-between between the, uh, the technology in the room, uh, the faculty, the students, uh, helping with training, uh, so a lot of different relationships there. Uh, and it's, it's just been a, a real neat experience. Uh, I don't think I'll ever get to do something as, as great and uh, exciting as this, but I hope so. That'd be kind of cool, never right? Never say never. Never say never. But uh, I've been here about 20 years, and uh, the last few years I've been getting to do this role. Before that, I was uh, more of an IT geek, working with virtualization and all sorts of other stuff. So. Howdy. Howdy. I couldn't resist. Uh, my name's Ed Pearson. Um, came to AM about five years ago from a career in industry. Uh, worked in large organizations and also worked in some private equity turnarounds. Um, part of the appeal coming down here from my point of view was things like this, right? Coming into a high growth environment, uh, a lot of energy to do things that had not been done before. And, and so as a, as a builder of systems that appeals, I run the IT organization for the College of Engineering and for one of the three state agencies that reports up through Kathy Banks, Dr. Banks, uh, who's the Dean of Engineering and also uh, Vice Chancellor of the three system members that are part of that, that organization. So it's been interesting and I thought I'd give you a little bit of a, of a back view of what it would, how we got to where we're at in terms of the design um, the types of, of feedback we went out and looked for, how we did that, and then a little bit of the technical design that went into this building. And then we're going to showcase it for you. Um, as was mentioned, um, about five years ago, we started asking if we built something like this, what would it need to look like? And the, the technology committee that was put together spanned everyone from IT geeks to a bunch of professors to department heads and students because we wanted to try to say what what should the building have in it. Uh, the first year was really spent talking to as many people as we could talk to. We went out and went to every faculty department meeting at least twice. We hosted town halls um, and then we traveled to visit a lot of other universities around the country that had already done things sort of like this typically on a little smaller scale. Um, and we went and said, what's working, what's not? What have you tried? Which partners have you looked at? Um, and we found that there was a, a real big gap from a technology point of view in terms of what people really wanted to do and the technology was there. So we went out on the limb a little bit and said, okay, well, we're gonna shift the way we pick a partner for this. We're gonna find partners from a technology point of view that are going to be ready when we are but may not be ready today. And so it wasn't a classical um, acquisition model where I issue an RFP and someone responds and I pick a vendor and we're, it was finding partners that said, well, here's what we've got today. Here's what we are going to have in the future and trust us, it'll be ready when you need it. So there was a little leap of faith involved in some of this. Um, and, it, and it worked across all kinds. So steel case that we had talked about, these tables didn't exist. We found lots of tables. There's all kinds of tables available. We had a hard time finding one that was what we wanted. So Steelcase sent down a development team and, and they came down and said, okay, you don't like any of our stuff, and they weren't too offended. What do you like? What do you want this table to be able to do? And so as I talked with some folks yesterday, we had already been through a very long discussion about the right number of people at a table. 
Is it three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eighteen? Somewhere in those ranges. And so it should be a round table or a square table or, you know, oblong tables and football shaped tables because we're in the SEC. Um, what should it be? And so it really revolved around how can we find a number that works that, the, from, a, uh, from a pedagogical point of view, gives us what we're looking for in terms of the experience. And then the and technology actually works with the table as well. It fits in a room oriented like this. It doesn't take up, it gives us the same number of seats we would if we had the traditional rows and chairs, all the criteria. So partnerships like that were very important. Finding an organization that would come in and say, okay, we think what we've got is great. What are, you, what are we missing? What should we add to this that would work in this environment? So we found partners across all the technology that we looked at that had that kind of view. And we partnered with them saying, and it's not a one-time purchase. It's not a, we're going to issue an RFP and then we'll be a customer. It's a multi-year relationship that we're going to establish because we want it to have an ROI that is beyond points of margin on a purchase, right? We want to provide a, an environment where our partners can come back in and say, we had this really interesting idea the other day. What if it could do X? And we look at them and go, great. Which, which one of the classrooms do you want to try X at? I have two available. Both the professors that are in there at the dominant time are professors that like to experiment change. So they're open to the idea. We can put it in that type of classroom and let them tell you what it looks like. So it gave us a freedom to partner with organizations that needed a place to prove things work. It gave us an opportunity for some of our professors who absolutely love new things. Uh, you, I know you can imagine that in engineering school, but they love new things and are open to that idea. So they were active participants in this and still are. We still bring technology in, whether it's big technology or even little stuff. Mark was experimenting with different laser pointers a while back. And we had volunteers that would try out different laser pointers, some of which worked, a couple of which didn't. Um, so it really has been that. We, we went back out, like I said, over and over and over in the design side of this with the faculty to say, what should the room have? Um, how much space do you really need so that as you walk around and interact directly with a student, it works? Most of our faculty's only experience with an active learning style environment was traditional rows of chairs and tables that you couldn't, they, they could hide from you. They could get it back in the middle of that area and you couldn't get to them if you wanted to come interact directly. Turns out about 10% of our students really like that. They're introverts, who knew? Um, and they don't like the fact that I can be instantly in their space asking questions of them. In fact, they want the traditional amphitheater 200 person auditorium where they can sit on the third row, fourth seat in, and pull a 4.0 and never interact with anybody. So our dean, when she laid out the things that she wanted this room to do, this building to do, that was one of the things she really thought we ought to fix, is you can't hide anymore. So. She also said, by the way, we want the faculty to teach in any style they want to teach. If they want to stand and deliver a very non-technical stand and lecture style format, give them the ability to do that. If they want to bring the tables up and have an, an active learning, give them the ability to, if they want to teach flipped, give them the ability to teach flipped. So that charter was interesting to try to fulfill. Then she came back and said, oh, by the way, we want the students to learn in the style they want to learn. So give them everything you can so that they can receive the education in a format that makes sense to them. And then she said, because I didn't look paranoid enough at this point, she said, and by the way, we want it to work fully for distance. We want the experience of a distance participant, whether that's a faculty member, a lecturer, or a student, to be as close to an interactive type of conversation, an interactive experience as you can make it. We're not as far along on the, that one yet. We're working our way through some technical challenges of how do you deliver that so that it's a true ex immersion experience. Um, 
but we're getting we're getting better at it. Um, so, given those guidelines, uh, and then working with the faculty in terms of how do you want to be able to teach and what feels comfortable to you from a teaching point of view, we started designing and laying out. We prototyped two of these rooms. Uh, early on in the process, which was important to us and something that I would recommend to everybody, do a prototype room to get your faculty comfortable and get you comfortable with the kinds of technology you're going to implement. <coughs> so we did that and we actually had faculty teaching in that room before we got this building ready to open. And we learned a lot from that process. It was very beneficial all the way around. Uh, we also built some pretty good advocates inside the faculty that we could then pull into these faculty meetings to say, oh yeah, I did that last summer. Here's how, what worked, here's what didn't work. But it brought a reality to that conversation that was important. So we went through that process, we built those uh, pr prototype rooms, and then we started just looking at how do we make it all work together. And Mark and the team spent a lot of time trying different components, working with different vendors to say, does the mesh work well here if I do this? We've learned a lot, and our partners have learned a lot as well, I think they would all tell you. Um, Wi-Fi, for instance, is an interesting example. Um, no classroom in engineering can have more than 100 people, which means 96 is the biggest ones in this building, and that's by order of the dean, because she, she wanted them all less than 50, and we just couldn't figure out how to build this thing that way. Uh, so she settled, we negotiated a settlement. Um, but, so since everything has to fit in that type of bucket, how do you do Wi-Fi for four, for a hundred people in a space this size so that they get, because all of our students have BYOD, so they get a guaranteed connection for their test or a guaranteed connection so that they can do things. So we started out optimistically thinking that the number was two and a half connections per person. We were wrong. So then we kept going. So then we said, got to be three. No rationality. It just seemed like a good number. Wasn't right. We started looking and surveying other buildings to see how many devices. We built this building, and I think we're low. We built it for four. So we assumed four connections per person delivered in this space at all times. And so that was the Fitbit, the cell phone, the laptop, uh, and an interesting array of other things. I, you know, I, I guess I haven't ever gotten that attached to Alexa, but I have students that bring her with them when they come to class. Uh, I'm not quite sure why, but it's a comfort thing. Um, but there's all kinds of, we had over 50 different device types connect this fall in this building. I didn't know there were 50 different ways to do things, but okay. Um, so, this is the kind of design. So our, our wireless provider, Aruba, learned a lot about how to shape wireless so that you're not parboiling baked potatoes on the table, uh, but you're delivering four and we have the ability to up that. But we learned a lot about how much power you, you set the, the power settings to be, how you design the shaping of it so that someone sitting in the hallway has Wi-Fi but not this Wi-Fi. And so We've done a lot of that. We've learned a lot about things. We've learned a lot about making sure you talk to architects about where the columns are going to be. Um, so it, it helps to have a boss who's a civil engineer because she loves building things and she has a high tolerance to things that are required from a loading point of view. So um, we've learned a lot about the technology. We've learned a lot about how to work with the staff and the faculty to take advantage of the room. So we started off really small. We said, if you've taught PowerPoint historically, come in this room and teach PowerPoint. You can do it with the technology up, or if you don't want it up, you can take it down. Make the buttons easy, so there's only three. Um, but be able to te let someone teach in the style they want, but then come back and say, but somewhere around week six, I'd really like for you to add in one more thing. Something just extraordinary, like a YouTube video. Um, but, but add something into that was humorous at one point in my life. Um, add something into it and then keep adding to it. Now, what we knew from our prototype room was there's a percentage of my faculty base 
that would start using everything it could do on day one. Somewhere around hour two, they will have found things we didn't even know the system could do and be using it as part. So there was going to be an early adopters pattern to our usage. Then there was going to be a prove to us that it's OK pattern. And then there was going to be a pattern that we really needed to move their class to another building that had rows of tables. So we knew we would accommodate all of that. Um, but we really went through that process and said, let's learn what works and doesn't work. So we built an entire group out that works with the faculty on, and you'll meet them today, works with the faculty on how do you best use the technology in your course, and then how do you adapt your course to best use the technology. So simple things like recording classrooms, right? So we have the ability to auto-record or manually start a recording and then let the students see that recording of the lecture and go back into it and pull notes from it or supplement the notes they should have taken during class. Um, and the interesting feedback to the faculty coming out of that is the ability to say, oh, did you know that one third of your class played back this 10 minute loop more than twice after your lecture? You might want to cover that again in the next lecture. None of them played back this 10 minute section which says they got it. But this one they didn't. And you ought to play it, you ought to reload that into the next class to talk about it. So by giving back some of that kind of data, it's been really interesting to watch the acceptance from the faculty side of here's what the technology can do to make us better. And, and to be able to deliver, because that's the ultimate goal that all of them have, is the ability to, to impart this knowledge in the most effective way possible. So it's been an interesting ride. Um, we're still learning a lot. Uh, if you look at some of the data we got back um, for other parts of the building, you've noticed all the little huddle rooms around that the students can book. Uh, they booked over 90,000 hours in those rooms this fall. Um, utilization during prime time hours, which varies for the students than it does for the workers, um, but during their prime time is over 96 percent. So you, we thought we built the app that we built so that they could see open available rooms and book them automatically. There aren't any open <laughs> available rooms most of the day. It's like two choices. Uh, but they can book out in those rooms, but they do it on weekends. 25 percent of the bookings are on weekends, which I thought was interesting. Um, we took down over 2.1 million wireless connections during the fall. Um, the other piece of data, in case you ever build something like this, that we found interesting, we thought most of the network traffic would be inbound, because it would be people looking at videos. It would be uh, all kinds of interesting things. Our traffic pattern's almost equal. It's a little bit heavier inbound than outbound, but not much. So. We were surprised by that. It was over 18 terabytes in. Um, but it's, an, it's been an interesting model watching some of the things we learned that we'd, we thought we knew and we didn't. Um, so as you look around, obviously you, the purpose of today is to get as many of your questions answered as we can, uh, to let the, the experts walk you through what we've learned, um, and hopefully jumpstart some of your programs as you move through this. So I hope you have a great day. Uh, ask a lot of questions. Uh, as you probably might have gathered over the last 24 hours, we're pretty proud of this thing. and I could talk for days about it, and they don't let me, so uh, I cram as much as I can into a short period. But ask the questions. Mark? Again, thank you for being here. I'm going to use the microphone because I know people way over there enjoy that. As a matter of fact, we're going to talk a little bit about all the technology in the room. It's not focused just on the T1V, but really about everything we're doing here. You heard Ed mention a lot about distance learning. Um, you, know, you know, one of the things I, I remember is we had requirements for what the building needed to do. And, and one of them I kept recalling, I, I watched the, the dean do this on TV uh, spots and things like that. She, she would go, oh, and it's gonna be the highest, uh, highest tech building in the, in the nation with all that. And I'm just going, okay, you know. And uh, when you have to select your technology about two years in advance and opening day have some really cutting edge technology, that's, that's a big deal. Uh, but that's, I think, where the beauty of the, the T1V system comes in is 
it's, it's very much software based. So in that situation, I'm not really stuck on a piece of hardware that can only do this certain thing two years ago, but it keeps developing and becoming something new and fresh. And that's what T1B did with us. So I want to start with just some simple things. Uh, the design of the room, uh, and let me stop for just a moment. If you have questions about um, how we train faculty, how we, tr how we do support here, um, let's see, how we got to selecting all of this, uh, a lot of those questions will be answered later. So if I tell you to hold that question for another time, we're going to do that, okay? Because I only have a limited time here. Uh, normally, uh, this kind of event will, will take about an hour to hour and a half for me to talk about it and show it but we're going to do it a little quicker. I have done it in 15 minutes before, but I hardly touch anything on the screen. So today I want to walk you through just some of the decision making about why we do the things we do in here. And so you'll see me walking around quite a bit, but for instance, why do I wear a microphone in a room like this? One is because you can't hear me very well over there. We've got a lot of stuff going on here, but as Ed mentioned, we're also recording a lot. So for us to pick up my voice anywhere in the room, the best option is for me to wear this microphone. However, if we have audience participation, so there's discussion questions, uh, we need to take care of that as well. So we've put some microphones up in the ceiling. Some of you know what they are and, and some don't, but these things with green lights up in the ceiling, those are our microphones. We have three of these located around the room. They can pick up a whisper or they can, I mean, they can pick up everything. However, it has uh, this adjustable gain with it, right? So that means if I'm talking, they're not gonna pick up those little whispers of the students way in the corner talking bad about my teaching style, uh, but it'll mainly pick up me. Why is that important though? It's because if I were to come over here and ask uh, Blair, how was your night last night? Okay, yeah, it was great. It was great. What'd she say over there? How about way over there? <laughs> Barely hurt. Okay. Let me show you something else. Uh, what, what's your name in the very far back back there? Dave. Dave. Okay. Dave, how was your evening last night? It's good. It's good. Okay. Now, why did, did everybody hear Dave? Okay. So why could we hear Dave, but they couldn't hear Blair very well? Where am I standing? when I asked her. She's talking to me. Okay, When you teach in a classroom and you're the instructor and you come over here with your students and you're asking them questions, they are not going to speak loudly. They're going to talk right to you. right? So we have to have microphones in the room to be able to pick up that level of audio. When I spoke to Dave over there, he's trying to get his voice heard all the way over here. So everybody hears him a little bit better. Okay, so again, you need to think about things like this. If you're going to have an active learning room, how do you pick up voices of people from across the room? Where is the instructor going to be? How are people going to be hearing them? How are you going to see the person? So you, you even, uh, some of the people over here, how's your view of the screen over here? It's horrible. Can't see it. Can't see it, Can't see it at all. See, I'm looking at it. but. But can you see that screen over there? Yes, you can. Can you see this? So literally, for this group over here, we've made it possible so that even if I'm standing right here, I assume that that same group can still see me OK? Would that be true? Yeah, over here. You all see me? Yeah, you see me, right? So with cameras and different things, the way we can move video around the room, we recognized that we had problems in the room with some of these columns. We specifically selected places to put this ThinkHub screen. There were some of the worst places in the room. Do we use this screen for, to, and expect people to see it? No. Why? Because it's too low already, really. If I had a group of 100 people in this room and everybody was trying to see what I'm doing on this board, I'm pretty much going to have to write about here up. So this much of the board is, is wasted, other it's green. So again, we have to make up for that by putting uh, other displays around the room and giving us the capability 
to change that, change what we're putting up there. But not only that, we've also included displays at your table. And we'll be showing those in just a little bit. Okay, but I'm just wanting you to understand a bit about why we do this. Now, an active learning room, a lot of people say you don't have a front of the room. You'll find a lot of our faculty stuck right here. Okay, and that's okay because they're just still learning about how to use this. I, I could move this anywhere in the room and pretty much do anything I wanted to from here. So I could decide, for instance, that um, I'm going to control the Think Hub up there. So I'm going to start a little application here. And so now being in the middle of, of a group of people, it puts me right here with you. You would be amazed at how the attention changes of the students as I'm standing right here, right? It's really cool to see. And we give our faculty the ability to do whatever they'd like to uh, from right here. If I need to move a certain part of my content around, I can do that. If I would like to, uh, for instance, show a PowerPoint on some of the displays around the room. I'm doing that now, okay? Ed even talked to you about the ability to use laser pointers. So we've designed this system to be able to take in a lot of technologies as they come out. This is, we built the system to kind of host technologies. It's, it's a place to park your content and to share it. But not only that, you can annotate on the content or around it. So laser pointers, how many people have seen somebody grab a laser pointer and point it at an LCD panel? Anybody? And you're in a big group, in a big room, maybe there's other panels and they're up there. If you'll notice here, and they're pointing and you can't see the pointer and everybody else is going, where is he pointing? I don't even know. So of course they've come out and this, this kind of stuff's been out for a while, but uh, these, these little tools that are extremely helpful, right? So I'm going to just hold the button down here for a moment. Ideally, that starts my presentation up there. Um, so now I've, I've got the ability to walk around anywhere in the room and share what I'm doing. I can come over here and point up to that display, right? You see it everywhere I'm at. I'm going to go through uh, the people's head over here, and, and you can see it even behind you there. So no matter where I'm at in here, I'm able to point to things. If I want to use a different type of pointer, it's as simple as just double clicking some things. So I've got a little green laser pointer now, OK? Double click a couple more times. Now I'm able to focus in. See, this is, this is technology that's just freely available. But it adds to the room. And as new things are coming out, it's very simple for us to put them in and make use of things like this. Why? Because this piece is central to hosting so many different things, and it's not stuck on today's technology. All right? So it's very, very handy. Uh, as we go along through this, you'll, you've seen all the different screens around the room. So some of the capabilities of this space allow me to show a lot of different content everywhere. And I'm going to kind of give you a sampling of that. So right now you see a, a lot of different content all around the room. Some of it's the same. Let me, uh, I'll switch this to Doc 2. So every single display, I can have custom content on it. I can have the same content. I can have something on three and something else on another three or two or however I want to work it. All right, so it is, it is extremely powerful, but if you notice, we also have a little solution up here that allowed me to take one object on this screen and share it up on these displays. Now that's pretty cool, because normally you have to share a device that can go up to a display. But with this technology, they've now set it up to overcome a problem we had. When we talked to our faculty, they weren't real keen on using 
a system like this because they said, well, I'm going to get up there and I'm going to write on that screen. And so as you can imagine, my, my microphone's getting out a little bit. As you can imagine, they would get up there and start writing and so all of a sudden it's filling up with all this content. Yeah, I don't have it everywhere. Let me, let me get that better for you. I'll put it back the way it was. Okay. So I may fill up this whole canvas right there in the, in the visible area. And once I have that filled up, I may want to move to a new area that's got some clean space to write on, right? How do my students see what I previously had done? Well, they can't. And that's what came up from our faculty is that's what they didn't like about a screen like this. So we, we talked to T1V and said, hey, we've got this problem. Can you help us? And there was a little head scratching, thinking about it. Not too much head scratching, though. And, well, maybe a little, Jim. It's looking, <laughs> looking yeah, maybe a lot of head scratching. But they came up with this solution. So in the best case scenario for our faculty, they may be up here teaching. And we're going to use uh, what's called a, a sketch pad here. I, I'll call it a sketch pad. And so again, this, this may be your note set number one. And they fill it up with uh, all sorts of really good stuff on here. And so right now, if I were to um, take this, I'm going to uh, <clears throat> send this to doc one. So right now around the room, you're seeing my notes I'm taking, right? Except for the one camera view over here, correct? So you can still see me, all right? When I finish this, when I got it all filled up, I can minimize it and start another sketch. Now, you're still seeing my number one up there, correct? So what I'm going to do, and, and what I should have done just before that, I'm going to make this one doc number two. I'm going to convert some of my displays to doc two. And the others are going to be doc one, OK? Now I bring my new sketch up here. You still see my number one notes on some of the displays. They're, they're in the back, really, right now and right above me. My new set of notes. Okay. I'm now able to deliver my previous set of notes as well as any new set of notes to my students. And I can keep adding more of these sheets still sharing them back and forth around. But not only did it allow us to do that, but because of their decision on how to do this, that means really any object that shows up on the screen can now be shared. So this is a PDF. It could be video. It could be a computer. So. Um, We'll just take we'll just take my Mac Pro here. We'll put that up on Doc One. Do a little wake up of it over here. So now you see multiple things happening. I can still use this. And by the way, I still haven't touched the displays at the table yet. Right? So a lot going on. I, I teach all of our faculty this. I, I go in a little different order for them because we have to start off as I want to show you how simple this room is. Okay, I, I started a little more deeper with, with you guys. So for a faculty to walk in and use this space, they hit one button to start the technology. And, it, and they can hit one button to start it with the displays down on the tables or one that brings them up. Choice number one. They'll hit the start button on the Think Hub, selection number two. They start writing with any kind of sharp-ended uh, device. There's nothing special about this stylus. It is a 
converted ink pen with some magnets thrown in, great idea, to hold it up on the board. And that's it. You could go get a favorite stick and whittle it with your knife and draw on this screen. Okay? Use soft woods, I'd prefer that. All right? Okay. So, and that was another one of the things we asked for is, can you fix us up with a stylus? And I said, and I don't want to pay a lot of money for it. Anybody ever lose styluses on some of these boards you've had before? And then they, they put it in their pocket and they're gone and you don't know who did it and you, you don't find it for a few days and by that time you've already bought another one and you paid your one or two hundred dollars for that device. You got it in, you set it up and then they bring it back. Oh, forgot this, right? It, it dies on you, it gets worn out. So literally, I've, I've told my faculty, if, if you lose your stylus in here, just ask one of the students for one. Okay, somebody's gonna have an ink pen. Just don't have the ink out when you use it, okay? So it's been really nice to be able to see how they use that technology. Some of them are as uh, minimal as, they just use a PowerPoint in here because that's what they're comfortable with. And I'm gonna talk later more about some of that design, but one thing I will say is we want all of our faculty to be successful in this space, right? Everybody likes to be successful, right? Anybody in here love to fail? I know there's gonna be somebody in here with a brain like three times larger than the rest of us. Well, I like to fail because it's a teaching moment for me and I learned from it. Just shut up, I don't wanna hear you, okay? It's, that just goes over my head. So we're gonna stick with the basics. We like to be successful. Our faculty like to be successful. And so when we buy technology, especially us, we, we buy this new cool stuff and we say, here, use it and use all of it, right? And we want you to do well with it. Well, they go in, it's hard to use, and they never want to use it again, right? So I've lowered the bar to make them successful. If you come in here and just write on the board, you're successful. If you walk in here and just put a PowerPoint up and stand here and talk, you're successful. Because that was the minimum, is just come in and begin using the technology. And over the semesters, as you begin to teach, you start adding a little more capability. You add a few more little button pushes. You, you add some more content. We're, we're getting this whole idea of, of engaging the students' minds throughout the class instead of just standing here and talking like I'm doing right now, right? Uh, now, every now and then I might come over here near you and all of a sudden you're going to pop up, right? right you're going to pay attention. Like if th these people way over here, they never look up at me, I notice. So I can begin to teach even from over here and suddenly I'm getting your attention a whole lot more, right? I'm, I'm engaging you. I'm, I'm right here with you. So that's why we develop classes like this. We have room enough for the faculty to walk around. They can control the system. They can write. They can present. Um, and all of that. So it's, it's a great situation to have. It's a great piece of technology we have that can host a number of these items. If I wanted to, I could even use my computer that I have right here. I'm going to put it up on this screen. I've now shared it out to some of these. I'm going to share it out to more um, of these, so you're going to see me hit some of these cool panels. This is just X panel if, from uh, Crestron if you're interested in what I'm doing. So I'm going to take Doc2 and send it to Displays1. Actually, I'm going to send it to all Displays because you guys can see me now right here where you're at. So literally, I now have the ability to teach from right here. There's nothing I, I can't do at this point. Um, you know, even OneNote is just a real simple little tool that you can use right here. Now, my Surface Pro here is a little old. It, it's a lot old, so it, it's trying to keep up with what I'm doing. But you get the idea here that I can come along, I can draw, I can write, I can do equations right here. I don't have to be there to do it. I don't have to be there to do anything whatsoever. You see me controlling every aspect of that system. But if I wanted to, I could still come up here and teach from this location. 
I can take my computer full screen. Not only that, but every computer system we hook up uh, that's a Mac OS or Windows OS, I can even come in here and uh, control the system. My finger becomes a mouse button on here, right? So again, really cool technology. It gives us a lot of capability. Um, let me see how we're doing on time. Okay. Now, I want to make sure y'all are getting opportunities to ask questions as we're going along. Okay. That'd be really good, I think, uh, because sometimes you forget in the context of what we're doing what the question was. So as we're moving along, please ask questions. Any questions right now so far? Yes, ma'am. What was with the Crestron interface? I mean, I thought the point of the T1B was that you didn't use that. That's great. So she's saying, uh, why, why are we using this Crestron interface? Thought the T1V took care of everything in the room, right? Jim, do you want to talk to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a, we do a lot of stuff to integrate with Crestron, and also we do a lot of things where we can try to replace Crestron. It kind of depends on what you're doing in the room, on what the right solution is. I think, you know, in this space, there's a lot of displays, and, uh, you know, our system currently has two different outputs that it can send to these displays, but there's more displays than just two. So, you know, an obvious thing is you can use Crestron to route these two signals to all of the different displays in, you know, and take other inputs in the room and route them kind of more discreetly than what we would do with ThinkHub, you know. Um, you know, we are, of course, always working to increase the number of outputs that we have, you know, the, but uh, that's something we're working on. Currently, we're at, where we support three is kind of a maximum of what we do. The, all the rooms here at Texas A&M were designed with two. Um, but, yeah. Now, so there, there's, uh, hold, on, hold on just a moment, I'm gonna finish answering your question. So, I'm also, I can get kind of anxious at times. Like the day before this building opened, I was extremely anxious, uh, but not terribly so. I mean, I was deciding whether I should show up for work that day or stay home, depending on whether I thought there were gonna be problems. You have to understand, we have around 3,500 devices connected that we're monitoring in here. We have 615 of these tables with view hubs in them, around 62 think hubs, uh, and nothing could go wrong, right? So, with that said, we designed these rooms with two layers of technology in it. Uh, they work very well together, but they can work independently pretty well, okay? So all these displays around the edge of the room, if that think hub system just suddenly crashed and everything died with it, Guess what? I, I can still teach my class. I can still present to the displays around the room. I can switch different content around still. What if that part of the room failed? So all my Crestron equipment just died. The processor quit working. Well, guess what? I still have the Think Hub and all the tables and its displays to share content to. I'm still able to teach. So yes, that's probably from my IT background. Everything I bought had redundancies in it. And I even think that way even in the AV world. Okay, there's probably two lines running to something everywhere. Uh, there's, there's, you know, redundant ways of doing things. So a lot of it was that way, but a lot of it was because that's a better way to handle as much as we have going on through here. Uh, we're using some of the new Crestron NVX units, which is uh, AV over IP type uh, systems. Works really well. And uh, we can talk more about that. This, this is the largest installation of NVX from Crestron. Uh, at an educational institution. We have over 700 of those devices. So it's, it's pretty cool as well. So continuing on though, oh, I'm sorry, was that, did that answer your question pretty well? Someone over here had a question. Do you, uh, do you have ALS assisted listening in the, in the room? Yes, we do. Yes, we sure do. Um, and so what, what we do for that is uh, those people will come in and uh, they will check out one of the devices for their room. They'll actually keep it for the semester. We don't have a high enough usage where we need to keep it in here for every class, so we'll let them keep it through the whole semester, and then they turn it back in at the end. So all of our content that's coming out, just like what, what's getting recorded, it's going to those devices. And what about cameras? I see one camera in the ceiling. Do you have tracking um, option for the instructor? And what about uh, student cameras? That's, that's a great question. 
Anybody know what kryptonite is? What, what's kryptonite? Somebody, somebody's gotta be a superhero geek. It's the weak spot of Superman, right? All right, so you just hit my weak spot, all right? It's, it's not so much a weak spot as I'm just really picky and technology's not there yet. So I have a camera, it does not track anything. Uh, and actually that was a, a, what the committee decided on is that one camera was gonna kind of stick to this area. This is where most people teach from. This is where we do presentations from. But we also wanted that second camera to be that immersive experience that Ed talked about, right? So that immersive experience, we, we began playing around with 360 cameras. Everybody would love to get into that, right? That's so cool. And you know, that's the first thing I said, oh, we need a 360 camera in the room because that way someone looking in can control where it's looking, they can move around the entire space and see faces and the instructor. What a great idea. Well, one, the output format isn't supported by many things that record or anything that records. At the time, it was YouTube. That's all that could play a, uh, a 360 video, and it's still about that. I mean, I think Facebook supports it. But the other thing was, when you get right down to it, where do you put a 360 camera? In the center of the room. Okay, way up there. Anybody ever played with the 360 camera? Where do you put it? Right about here. So imagine a pole coming down from the center of the room and the camera's sitting right here. Yeah, that's not gonna work so great. What a horrible idea all of a sudden. Okay, so we realized we have to have things like that out on the boundary of the room. And so some of the things I'm looking at now are some of the more panoramic type cameras uh, that, that don't have that distortion of stretching, right? But it, it also still gives us a lot of good clarity. We can still pick it up on our recordings and it gives that user that experience like I'm sitting at a table maybe here. So if I, if I mounted it here, it could see 180 degrees and it feels like I'm, I'm sitting right here. So I'm, I'm not any better or any worse than any other student in the room, but I can see everywhere. I can see the instructor walking back and forth. I can see, I can look back over here and see this guy messing around while the instructor's over here trying to get people's attention. So just like in class, I'm getting that same experience, okay? So that, that's what we're looking at right now. I'm working with a couple of vendors to see about uh, what they would recommend. The, the issue, I have a solution for our smaller rooms. This room, not yet. Yes, sir. The, um, what type of um, corner was that, the, the name of it? This is a uh, Logitech Spotlight. You'll see these on uh, some of the TED Talks, right? And it's a uh, rechargeable device. It can work over Bluetooth or it has an adapter that plugs into USB. <coughs> the charge, on, uh, you charge these up every now and then. They last about three months per charge during fairly heavy usage. Who else? You? Well, I've, I've been trying to. <clears throat> so, like one one room set up like this, it's easy to see. That's awesome. Um, you have an entire building where you said how many how many installments of this site? Uh, thirty six. So there are thirty six that use this type of technology. So thirty seven, really. So certainly there is also just benefit of. Um, consistency from room to room, so when faculty are learning, they can quickly move if they have to yep. or in different courses. Is there any other, is there any other like collaborative benefit that is achieved by having so many rooms? I mean, is there a connectivity between them in any way that that, I, that would be missing? So you you heard Ed talk about the the hundred uh, hundred people, right? So what happens if I join this room to another room? How many people am I teaching? 200, yeah, great. You probably got an A in math, see? Um, so was that a big consideration for us to try to make sure we can join two rooms? Not at all. Can we do it? Absolutely. But not at all in this building. Now we had the first two weeks we opened, someone got sick, who knew? Yeah and said, I want you to team teach our two sections tomorrow. And so we could link them together that way. 
The biggest reason you see the connectivity that we've got isn't for in-building, it's building to building and campus to campus. So we've got campuses in, in Galveston that's focused around a lot of ocean engineering stuff. We've got a campus down in McAllen, which is the southern tip of Texas. Um, and then we've got five, soon to be six academies around the state, giving them the ability to link in here. And as I write on this board or they write on their board, you share it back and forth. That's the, the connectivity side we're pushing on. We're, we're not pushing on it more than we have to for in this building. Although it's there, and week two, we got an opportunity to use it in last minute discussions. Uh, but it really is about how do I extend that presence out to another classroom in another location, or to students or instructors in another location. Yeah, so um, we have, um, a new feature that uh, T1V is adding. We're, we're kind of doing some beta testing and occasionally throwing in an alpha test along with it uh, with our Galveston campus. So it, this ThinkHub becomes a really cool device now to where you, you hit a couple of buttons and you're now connected with another ThinkHub with uh, not only just sharing the canvas, but also with audio and video as well. We might be able to show it today. We'll, we'll see if we get an opportunity. If we have time, we'll do a quick demo of that. That's a yeah. new feature that's gonna be released in about a month, but we'll preview that for you if yeah. we have time. So it, it's, it's very cool. It's had a lot of positive uh, comments from our faculty that use it because previously they've been using WebEx, okay? And uh, I mean, as long, if you've used it for several years, you would say, what's the big deal? Right, it's, it's easy to use. But when you're in the middle of a class and you're trying to get things working, and you're trying to move things here and there and show content, it can be a little confusing, right? So simplicity is the big thing. And that's what we're finding out. Our faculty love about it. It's uh, you, you, you name a session, you tap a couple of buttons and you're connected, right? So it, it is super simple, it doesn't require Logins. You can put a password on your sessions that you create so that each side has to put in that password. But uh, overall, I mean, super. It's just really amazing. Uh, still working on those, those few last bugs, but they're really pretty minimal. Uh, I have no doubt that they'll take care of that. Who else? Oh, yes. So this may be covered in another session, but I'm curious about how you prepare students to learn in a space like this. Um, because it's a very different, they need to have a 360 view rather than just taking notes. And so how do you prepare students for all this technology? So uh, any of you have children right now in K through 12? You, you, a few people? Okay, I, I feel like I've had kids in K through 12 for the past 20 years. Actually, I have had you have. them. Yeah, so I have eight kids. Um, so if you, if you want to talk to somebody that knows and understands how they're being taught, they're already being prepared for some of this stuff. Uh, as a matter of fact, when they come out of high school to college, for most of them, the experience is worse from where they just came from. Now I'm going to set them in a room, and we're lined up in rows, and I'm going to stand up here and just lecture you the whole time. They didn't do that in schools much anymore. They're engaging them. They're, they're, they're activating their minds to be uh, of great use, right? Uh, one of the studies we find is that in a normal lecture type period, after 15 minutes, the brain activity is equivalent to someone that's been driving drunk at above the uh, legal limit, okay? So that's the bulk of their time in class is at that level of activity in their brain for the other. So how do you prepare them? They already kind of work this way. Have you ever seen students just hanging out yeah. in little groups? They love getting around a table together on their phones, talking with each other, I'm pretty sure, over their phone. They're texting right across the table. I think that's what's happening. I think that's what happens in my own home, right? Uh, I'll hear my daughter laugh, and my wife will say, that was funny, wasn't it? And then I'm, I'm going, what's going on? And then another one's going, Dad shouldn't be tagged. You know, anyway, it's just ridiculous. So um, they already know. They walk in this room 
we haven't had to show them. We had faculty say, well, how are you going to train the students? When we did our proof of concept, we found out very quickly we didn't need to train our students. They were already in here way ahead of stuff. We tried to train them one time, so students all got seated. They had already brought up the displays, already connected all their devices to things. We're sharing things up on the table, laughing and everything, and I was kind of like, uh, what's the point of me here again? I started to talk and they were like, whatever, just, you know, get on where we got this. So it was super easy. Uh, some of our faculty are the same way. Our younger faculty, we, they'll come to the technology training and they're just waiting for me to stop talking. Just get out of the way and let me come up there. And they start doing amazing things and it's, it's incredible to watch. Okay, so it, I don't worry about the students. Now, Ed, you want to talk to them a little bit? I know you've talked about some of our well, introverts, right? I just wanted to follow up with that. Is, is that experience the same in other divisions or colleges on campus or, well, maybe you haven't implemented this technology in those areas, but, I mean, I'm assuming you were talking about the engineering. Well, but even within engineering, understand, this building represents about 25% of my classroom space in engineering. So 75% is still a traditional view of rows and tables and chairs. Um, we haven't quite figured out how to retrofit a 60-year-old building uh, to be appropriate for this. We're, it's on his list of things he has to figure out. Um, so I've still got a lot of traditional space, even inside of engineering, much less in the other colleges across the university. Um, but we are seeing, especially in some of the other colleges, small rooms like this being set up so that the experience is starting to move across other, part, other colleges within the university. Um, and we're starting, like I said, to try to figure out how to retrofit some existing buildings so it's not only new construction, but, but retrofit. Um, it's a challenge, right? So how do you put low profile raised floor in a 60 year old concrete slab building, right? Um, it's a challenge. Uh, there's ways to do it. And, and so we're working through that. We're, we're seeing a huge adoption rate from the students who try to schedule as many of their classes in this building as they can because it is the style they want to be in. Part of the, what you saw on the design of the building, and you probably heard about on the tour, all the natural light was a direct requirement from our students that they got tired of feeling like they were in a dungeon every time they walked into one of our buildings. And having walked into many of them, I would agree with their analysis of what it feels like. So they said, no, we want natural light, we want glass, we want to be able to feel like we're in a, a new experience, not an old one. But we haven't, we haven't saw, so if you come up with a solution, please share. <laughs> we're looking for that, that magic bullet. We have done uh, you know, follow-ups with a lot of the different universities that we have installed this technology and it's a pretty common theme that we hear when we ask the students we you know we go to after classes and we say you know we, we notice you're using this you know how did you learn to use it who trained you they're like oh nobody trained me we just figured it out you know and then we've we've heard that so many times from the students we don't hear that from the professors but we do hear that from the students a lot so uh, you know I think you know we, we spend also a lot of time trying to make it very intuitive on how to use so you know Hopefully some of that work that we've done is helping. And that, that was a key, but, you know. a key thing the dean did. She made it a requirement. If you're going to teach in this building, you must go through at least one type of training. And we strong, she strongly recommends you do both. The first one is how do you use the technology? The second one is how do you adapt and work with the team that helps change curriculum, your curriculum to take advantage of the change in, in potential that's there. And, but she, it was a strict requirement. Um, and so it, it was a, it were, since it was a requirement, if you didn't do it, you're, you're still teaching somewhere else. Uh, she was pretty rigid about it. And, and it, what it became was more and more folks started experiencing it and now the, the demand this spring was pretty heavy. Uh, they couldn't get all the classes in here they were trying to get. Yeah. Tell us about if you've got any data on how those introverted students who really like being in the middle and not talking like the students who don't like active learning, how would they adapt to this? They, they tend to get in the back corners, so you, you still spot them. They, it's hard to overcome their habits. 
Um, many of them, but not all, but many of them have come out of the shell a little bit and said, well, I don't like the fact that someone's in my space quickly, but I really like the fact that I can replay a recording in my room, in my privacy, without having to come down and ask a, a TA or someone else to explain. So the fact that we give them alternative ways to view the same information offsets the fact that they really don't like inclusion into their space. Um, so, but, but they also, a lot of them are taking classes over in the traditional uh, basements of some of our other buildings. Um, and that's okay. I, we're very comfortable with that. As a tag on to that, is the, and it's not that I don't trust what you just said, um, but is there any empirical information about this, any studies, any uh, uh, feedback loops that you've captured? Not yet. So, uh, and, and I would ask you to uh, save some of those questions for the 11 o'clock session. We're going to have uh, Dr. Pasole here, and he can probably answer some of these questions even better. But as you can imagine, we have researchers for whom this is the world's largest petri dish, and they are—they have been actively involved in the building since we let them in in August. That's the, the, the 11 o'clock. Is that what you said? The, the time of faculty. Yep. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Yes. So, any anybody in here love to push buttons and see things happen? Mike does. You do. You do. Like how much? Yeah, it gives you joy though to see something, something move, right? All right, well you get to come over here. All right, you get to come over here because I want to give you satisfaction today. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm I'm going to ask you. This is a touch screen, so do you have a finger? I I'm, I knew it, I knew it. Good. All right, so you're going to hit tables up here. All right, now hold it. Don't don't hit anything else. What does it say here? The action will cause the tables to move. Please ensure there is nothing to interfere with the movement of the tables. Now, actually, it's the displays. The tables aren't going to start hovering in, in place or anything like that. But there is a section on these tables that has a small door right at the end down here. I would ask you to make sure you've moved anything out of the way. These are these coffee are coffee cups are important. Coffee cups, yes, please. So, <laughs> all right, we see yours uh, now. This is uh, this is something that required a lot of effort, but I want you to get ready. Go ahead and hit that red button. Red means don't do this, right? Yes, sir. And yet you're dying to push that red button, so go right ahead. All right, let's see something happen here. So in a live demo, you always get nervous until certain things come up. Yeah, we have a little hiccup here, and uh, that's, that's a great comment. I'll let you sit down now. You don't get to push any more buttons. You did a great job though. Thank you. All right. So uh, during our design with Steelcase, we, we hit an issue where, uh, well as you can imagine, these have some current sensors to make sure we're not going to cut people's arms off if they uh, have them stuck under these displays and things. So uh, without going into a lot of detail, we're still working on a few little kinks on a few of the tables, but this is pretty easy to take care of. I'm just going to Tell it to move up one more time, and it'll it'll come on up. Um, or it, it's so close, it wants to come up. <laughs> yeah, he broke it. <laughs> Do you ever have people like trying to like manually fix it? No, not really, not really. Yeah. All right. So we now see these displays have popped up. These are running with a little Mac Mini. It's the View Hub product that uh, T1V has, and it's all part of the ThinkHub Connect system. So um, some of the things that we can do with that, and I'm going to uh, actually do this with my, I've got to tap here, with my computer. Actually, I need to, there we go. So I'm going to, clear the canvas real quick so because I got a lot of stuff up here okay let's start fresh so I have my laptop that's connected wirelessly from over there 
And say I want everybody to, now this is the instructor that I, I hear, everybody should be able to see me all the time, so I'm gonna change all my room displays to where they all have a camera view of me, right? I'm the center of attention. But I still want them to see what I'm doing on my computer. So once these tables come up, I now have a new button along with Doc 1 and Doc 2 that allows me to cast. So right now in this space, you're able to not only see the content that I'm sharing, but also where I am in the room, what's happening, okay? You can very clearly see my presentation. I'll throw up something with some text there. And so for our students, this is a great uh, feature for them to have. So not only can I push content, and this is nothing new. We've seen this in rooms before. I can push content here. I can pull content from it as well. I can even control from the Think Hub. So like if I have four displays connected or four computers connected, I can select which one I want to use at any given time. Okay. But what's really cool about this is I have just a single data line going to each table. One data line. For most projects that do something like this, you'll have at least two and usually three data lines trying to make all of this happen. This is, again, a software-based solution. It is not running over any multiplexers in the closet. My closet has a rack that's about two-thirds full to run this entire space. It uses a lot of uh, AV over IP and software-based solutions to do most of what you see in here today. If I had someone connect to one of these, I could easily uh, bring it up on this display as well. So once I brought the tables up, you'll see that every table becomes a new device for me to use. So I'm just going to grab, oh, a whole bunch of them here real quick. I'm going to use a feature that T1B's added in here for me. And it's going to real quickly align all my apps for me on the screen. I would now be able to see, and let me share my canvas out to your, your screens instead. There you go. Now everybody can see that. So what you would see instead now is all the activity going on at each table. You literally could have all 25 of these tables on the screen, and as the instructor, if they're working in groups, you can monitor just a little bit of what's happening. And if you see something that's really cool, you could even share that one table with the whole group. Again, I could take number, table number eight, and I'm gonna send it to doc two. I'll even change my uh, displays here, so doc two to all displays. So now you're gonna see what's happening at that table. I could even cast that one table to all of your tables, right? So a lot of capabilities, a lot of solutions. So in answer to further answer the question of how much the introverts like this environment, they're not having to come up to the front of the class and present. You can have the right answer on your local display and I can share it around the room without asking you to do that. So that overcomes some of that reluctance as well and, dry, and keeps them in the space that they might try to get out of. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that we really understand the concept. So at each student workstation you have Mac Minis installed, I mean you have Mac Minis uh, attached to the monitor. You have a think of software installed on each station, correct? Yes. Right. So four, all, if all four of us had our BYOD devices, we could all four connect and have a quarter of that screen. And then you can, the whole design of this was to be able to pull content from the student and push content to it. And so it really helps if you're visually challenged, as some of us are, um, to not have to try to stare at a whiteboard halfway across the room, I can put up a highly complex CAD CAM drawing or SOLIDWORKS drawing on this screen and individuals can still see it and annotate and look at it without having to depend on someone taking notes from the front row. So it has become something that the students really buy into because it makes that experience in the classroom better. Okay, and, and to piggyback off of that, so you said that, so if you have four people sitting at a table, 
and each person connects with their own device. All right, you're going to have a quad here with each person's device. Um, can you isolate the individual user's um, device on here and then share it? Yes. And so you would then send it to either doc one or doc two and then share it through all the. Yeah, I can send it to their tables to doc one, doc two. Okay. So the way you do that is when I see it up here on the screen, it'll show me the quadrant view and I tap on the one computer that I want to see and it'll make it full screen, not only there, but at, at their table. Right. Yes. Were there any studies done on uh, faculty readiness, adapting their teaching to other words, not just, the, just how to use the technology, but the all eyes on me uh, for understanding purposes. Now you have a room where they're looking at all sorts of things. They're looking at screens, they're looking at their devices, uh, they're talking, whatever. So was that sort of a curve? So I'm, I'm going to ask you to save that question again for Dr. Pausole when okay. we get here, because that's he will talk forever about this stuff, <laughs> okay. literally. Yes, sir. I've got a question. So what about distant learning? Like all this technology is pretty cool and it's mind blowing. But what if I'm at home and I want to connect with them? Yeah, is that's possible? it is. It is. So what if we had a group of uh, four people here, but we want to add another fifth person as part of your group, right? So the reality of it is that person outside the university can connect to this display and not only see what his group is doing, but share his content to this display while, so the, the students are here. One of them just starts up something like WebEx or Skype with that one student. And they use their camera on their laptop, they use their microphone on their laptop, and they're able to not only share the content, but also to include them in the conversations and all of that. It's really, really simple. Yeah, yes ma'am. Um, so, so much of this is fantastic because it's taking into consideration universal design and access and that sort of thing. Yes. But I'm wondering particularly about um, students with different visual needs and is there a way, how does what they need on their personal device interact yeah. with the system? So the, the software is called Air Connect and they can put that on their device. And so for, for some of those visual needs, they have a great uh, capability as part of Air Connect. Uh, not only can you, you send your screen to it, but you can also access the content and just see it on your computer. And not only that, they've added a feature where you can zoom in to any area of the screen. So if I've got a visual problem, I, I need to see a little closer, larger detail, I'm in control of that. Right. What about uh, translation? So as you're speaking, having it show students on the screen, like is that... We, we do not have that here. That yet. Is, and I would even, yeah, yet. Yet. I would even say it's not real feasible yet. Uh, most of your translation software does a poor job, even with just normal everyday conversation. Now let's throw in some engineering terms. Oh my goodness, no. Uh, so three questions all at one time, real quick. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just real quick, you talked about being able to share things. Well, I've got my device connected to here, and you put up this wonderful equation that, oh, I want that. Can I save that on my device? You sure can. At any point, you can click a button that says, um, uh, well, it, it saves the PDF, right? I can't remember. Yeah. 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 And a lot of our professors are starting to use that, right? So they save snapshots off to the far edge of the screen so that they can bring them back as one of them explained evidently students have a habit if you're in the middle of really presenting a bunch of stuff if i can drag you back a few minutes i can slow the class down a bunch what the chart you you put up before i got a question about it now let's go back if you can just click on that screen and say here's the chart what part of this didn't you get it it reduces that option uh, that's that's uh, there. So they are doing that. The other thing that we're they're really starting to use more, and that's the purpose of this spring, is to get them into the next phase of this, is the ability to save a session. So if I finish Tuesday at four o'clock and and I want to save it so that I can start Thursday at the beginning of class, I can save that entire session and bring it right back up, and I'm where I left off. So somebody had a question. You got that screenshot there. Yep. Okay, we have, we have a very hard cutoff of, uh, in five minutes uh, because we actually have a class coming in here that's going to start off and we're going to join them about halfway through. 
So real quick, I'm gonna just finish up with, with the tables themselves. These are from Steelcase. We did work with the design from that, but the T1V systems are also real uh, pertinent to how the table operates, not just showing students content, but again, I told you we have one data line coming here. Do you ever think about how this lift is moving up and down? I, I push a button here and it happens there, okay? Here again, T1V really came through for us and they created, I mean, they built a custom piece of hardware to set in there to not only let us know the status of the lift, and, but also to report whether it's working or not up to the display and to actually move it up and down. So that little Mac Mini in there is, is managing the lift system. It's also setting the defaults on the display. It's putting it in standby, turning it on. So all of those things are happening from that one device right in there. So it's, it's not just content sharing, okay? So we have, I, I've got to cut off right there, but um, I'll answer maybe two more questions. See anybody, have any, somebody over this way? Yes, sir. You talk about lecture capture. I, if you did, I missed it. Can you cap, record then uh, play back the lectures? Yes, yeah, so we have, uh, we're using the media site system here. Uh, we have a three input lecture capture device. So it is set up to, by default to capture the camera. Uh, it also captures dock one. So whatever dock one is set to, uh, by default it's that canvas. Uh, the third input, the, the faculty can decide of the many different sources what it may be. So anywhere from different computers, the dock camera, or even dock one and dock two, so forth. Do you have any system for dealing with uh, authorization to view the lectures? Like only for students that yeah, attended? Yeah, that, that goes through our uh, LMS system that, that manages that, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna finish right there.